Welcome back to Acting Lessons Learned. I'm Tawana Floyd, your host, and I want to say thank you. I'm always going to say thank you because I can't believe how many people are not just listening, but are actually reaching out to me and telling me how much they love the show. And I want to shout out a few people who have been listening and, you know, expressing how they love the show. So, Mikael Bizet, yes, girl, thank you. Todd Reason May, Lisa Rodriguez, Rafael Odunia. Terry Gamble, Rose Nicornette, and Oscar Nunez. I appreciate you all so much. And if this is your first time, welcome and thanks for choosing this podcast. I appreciate you all for dropping in to spend some time with me. And as a quick reminder of what I do here, I share the lessons I've learned and learning while pursuing my acting career. Today, I will talk about booking my first co-star. But first, I want to shout out my first theatrical agent, James J. Jones, from the now defunct Premier Talent Group. James was a lovely human being. Oh, wait, I realize I'm speaking in the past tense. He's not deceased. He just closed his offices. And I haven't seen him in over 10 years, but he's alive, I hope. Um, But he was a wonderful person. And you know what? Maybe I'll make my next episode about how I met James J. Jones and how he came to be my agent. It's not the formal submission to meeting to sign story. It's a pretty remarkable story. So yeah, I'm going to make this my next topic of discussion. But back to the topic at hand, James was quite the strategist because I had no credits and he knew that he had to be imaginative to get me into casting director's offices. The first audition James got me was this co-star role for security guard number two for FX TV's Terriers. And it was filmed in San Diego, which meant that I had to drive to San Diego to audition, which can be about a two to four hour drive from LA, depending on the time of day. I was so excited to receive this audition and I kind of had it in my head that the role was mine because it was starring Donald Logue and I was a fan of Donald Logue. He was, he's like, he is one of my favorite character actors. (laughs) Am I the only one who thinks that when you have a special connection to somebody that it's destined to be yours? The thing is, I'm not the only one who's a fan of Donald Logue, so I had to put that out of my head and get down to work. I wanted to knock this audition out of the park. Oddly, though, there were two security guard roles, security guard number one and security guard number two. And for whatever reason, security guard number two had the most dialogue compared to security guard number one. But both guards would be in four scenes. And I had, I think, two, maybe three days to work on the dialogue, which is plenty of time. I wanted to get coached, but at that time, the girl's pockets just wasn't doing it. So I just had to pair my extraordinary work ethic with my Meisner training and break down that script, build a whole backstory. It was a new show, so they didn't release a script, which meant I had to create my entire backstory from my imagination. Y'all know how it is. You know what we do. We build these characters. And so I worked on this scene like a couple of hours a day for two days, I believe, leading up to the audition. I wanted to know this dialogue inside and out, standing upside down, twirling around in a circle, falling down the stairs. I know that's extreme, but I'm just saying I wanted to know this dialogue because I wanted to book this role. I asked one of my roommates to run lines with me. Now, granted, it was 10 o'clock at night, and so she gave me this dry read like she just wanted to get it over with, and I get it. I came to her late, but she was happy to help me, and I so appreciate her for doing that. I just needed to hear the words and the cues and have a different read than my rendition, which is what she offered me. I was confident that I had a handle on who this security guard was and her persona, how she handled her job, and what she was doing in the scene. And the next thing I needed to work on was my outfit. I wanted to look like an authentic security guard. I had black pants. I had a tan long sleeve button up blouse. And I had this fitted Sienna quilted zip up vest. I don't know what made me want to wear the vest like it was Kevlar or something. But I needed it because it was in the action 
and in the dialogue that I had to talk through my walkie-talkie that was on my shoulder and the vest was going to help me put my old beeper. Don't ask me why I had a beeper back in 2010. I just did. I still have it. So I used my beeper and put it on top of the vest on my shoulder to make it seem like that would be the walkie-talkie that I would talk into. So I rehearsed with this walkie <laughs> I want to call it a walkie-talkie. I rehearsed with this beeper and the vest was important and an instrumental part of the outfit. I, I feel like my audition was about 10 or 11 in the morning and I hadn't been to San Diego before and I definitely hadn't driven before, but I knew I wanted to give myself enough time to be able to deal with traffic or any hiccups and maybe just get there like 45 minutes to an hour prior just to settle down and get ready. And now mind you, this was before Google Maps and smartphones. Actually, I think the first iPhone was out, but I didn't have it. So I had to print out the directions from the internet and follow the paper as I drove. I think it was like Yahoo Maps or maybe it was like MapQuest. Either way, <laughs> that's how I got to San Diego. The morning of my commute to San Diego, I packed a bag of snacks, I put some bottled waters in the car, and I put my vest in the back, and I headed south at 8 in the morning. The ride was pleasant. It was scenic. There were moments where it was just like this vastness and then some water, and I hit a little bit of rush hour, and then it smoothed out. And then I reached in my back seat for water and discovered I left my vest at home. Ugh. Oh. I really needed the vest. I needed the vest for the page or walkie-talkie situation. Since I started my commute early, I figured, let me just pull over and try to find a target. But again, I don't have a smartphone. So what am I just going to do? Just drive around and get off any random exit? And then Providence in all her glory always shows up at the perfect time for me. And I saw a gas station sign at a rest stop. So I took that exit, went to the gas station, and asked them if there was a Target nearby. There wasn't, but there was a Kmart. Now don't act like y'all don't remember Kmart. Okay, maybe if you're a millennial, you don't remember Kmart. I think there's like five left in the world. But Kmart was kind of like Target before Target came on the scene. The gas attendant gave me directions. I headed to Kmart, and it was enormous. And I was overwhelmed, and I didn't know where to start. So I was like, let me just look up at the signs and the aisles. And I saw hunting goods. And I feel like people who hunt always wear vests. So I went over there and I found a vest like that. Like it was so easy. And so I found one that was actually a better color because it was army green and it seemed to go more with the security guard type of feel. And within 20 minutes, I was in and out of that store and back on the road. So now I'm arriving in San Diego and my nerves are starting to, <laughs> they, they starting to show themselves. They trying to let me know they're there. It took me about two hours to get to San Diego. I found the location. I parked. I walked up to the building. It was like a small, unpolished street level office. I put my vest on and I went inside. I was early. I was the first actor there and I felt embarrassed for being there so early. It's kind of like, you know, arriving to the party like an hour before while they're still putting up the party favors and you can tell that they resent you for being there. <laughs> Although they didn't resent me for being there. They were actually really warm and I can't remember who addressed me. Maybe it was like an assistant or an associate. They were asking me about the drive from LA. They offered me water. They showed me the restroom. And then they said they'd be starting soon. And I just sat in the waiting area by myself, waiting. Other actors started to arrive. So this guy walks in and he's wearing a dingy, stretched out t-shirt, these tight, raggedy jeans and dirty sneakers. And I'm like, what the heck? Then a woman walks in and she got her hair as long and flowy like she just did it. And she's wearing a nice t-shirt and nice jeans and flip-flops. And so the room just started to fill up with people who were just like not appropriately dressed for the security guard. And they were only seeing security guards that day. Now, this was my first network TV audition in California. And I was starting to get uncomfortable feeling I had done too much. <laughs> that maybe perhaps in California, people dress in jeans and t-shirts to audition instead of hinting at the role. One guy even mocked me by saying, oh, you went all out, huh? Ain't nobody ask him. 
I began questioning my outfit. I thought, maybe let me go to the bathroom and take the vest off. But I didn't want to call more attention to myself. Then I questioned if I should use the pager at all. Like, I just felt like I was just overdressed. And I felt like all eyes were on me. So I was embarrassed in the waiting room. I was getting hot. I'm nervous. Uh, My pits are getting itchy and sweaty. And then the assistant calls me to go into the audition room. (sighs) I walk in. I meet the casting director who sat across from me. She had no emotion on her face. And now I'm thinking, oh, she's probably looking at me like, she's, why is she coming in here like this? This is not how we audition. So I just remained really quiet. She asked for my picture, my resume. She began to read it. And then she asked me about one of the theater credits on my resume and where it was from. So I told her the theater company because that's what I thought she meant. And then she asked, I don't know what state. And I said, Harlem, New York. And so her eyebrows raised and she was like, okay. Now everyone was supposed to read both security guards. First the number two, because it had the most dialogue, and then the number one. Now it was time to offer my performance. Yeah, performance. Some people say audition, but you know, we in the room, I'm about to perform. I'm about to let her know. I'm doing it as if it's the day. I put my pager on top of the vest armhole up by my shoulder I took a breath, and then I began the scene with urgency. I wasn't nervous at all because I knew the sides inside and out. I was living the emergency in this tiny office. When I was done, she gave me a redirect and told me to do it again. So I gave my performance again with the new direction, and when I finished, she looked at me and said, I don't need you to read the other role. It's clear you'll be able to do the smaller role. She thanked me for coming in, confirmed that I had no conflict for the shoot dates, and that was it. I walked out of the audition room into the waiting area, and now all the actors were looking at me with like varying degrees of uneasiness. They all heard my audition, and I gather they were concerned about following me. I was no longer embarrassed by my outfit choice. I did what I needed to do to feel like I was in that scene's environment. It informed the story, and it impacted my performance. I got to my car and began my commute back to Los Angeles, which took me four hours. And then I didn't hear anything. My agent didn't call with a call back. I felt like a lot of time had passed, and I figured I didn't book the job. So I forgot about it. And one day, while sitting on my patio... I received a call from the casting director. She had been trying to call my agent, but she didn't receive a response because it was Memorial Day. The producers had just booked the role, and I was security guard number two. She gave me the dates to confirm that I would be available and said she would call my agent the next day to negotiate the deal. Oh my gosh, I sat on my patio. I was so excited. It was a surreal moment. I felt accomplished. I felt talented. I felt delighted. I felt proud of my choices. Adding the vest and the old pager as a walkie-talkie. Stopping at the Kmart on my way and not abandoning my outfit in the room. It proved I wasn't doing too much. Those actors weren't doing enough. And I was comparing myself to them, ready to drop my bar of excellence to meet them. I have to believe that because it's San Diego, and no shade to you, San Diego, this is just my experience at that time. You might have gotten better. I don't know. But I think because it's such a smaller market and they don't have a lot of union television there, that the actors just didn't really know the degree of what they were auditioning for. So now it was time for me to drive back to San Diego. It was a location shoot and I was given one shoot day and the call time was like a mid-afternoon so it made the drive from Los Angeles to San Diego effortless. I arrived back to San Diego in a different location. I parked my car but this is my first booking on a television show so I don't know where to go but there are trailers so I'm just kind of like walking around slowly, kind of lingering, because I didn't know what to expect, where to go, or who to look for. And then a second AD, assistant director, introduced himself to me, 
and took me to my first trailer. It was so cute. It was like, it was like a closet, but I loved it. I was so happy to be there. And inside, there was my contract and what I call a baby script. A baby script is a mini script of the scenes being shot for the day, but it's like half the size of a script. So I guess you can kind of like put it in your pocket, but I didn't know what to do with it. So I just read it because I didn't know what was happening that day. And then it was time to go for a wardrobe fitting. So I left the baby script in the trailer because what did I need it for? I knew the lines. Because I drove to San Diego on the day, they didn't want to have me come back for a fitting and then come back for the shoot. So they did the wardrobe fitting on the day. And when I got to wardrobe, I met my counterpart, security guard number one. He too had driven from LA and like me, he was a native New Yorker. So we got along immediately. And when he learned it was my first co-star, he was so supportive and protective, like a big brother. I called him my new big brother. We were there for a night shoot. So we put on our uniforms and we sat in a holding area and it would be several hours before we would shoot our first scene. Then we were summoned to rehearsal. Okay, I'm getting excited now. So the second AD brought us into a private room and there's Donald Log and actor Michael Raymond James and the episode's director, Michael Offer, the script supervisor. Everyone was kind and hospitable. They introduced themselves. They made us feel comfortable. And then it was time to rehearse the scene. And I'm ready to do it. And then I realized everybody pulls out their baby script. And then I start to panic. I didn't know I was supposed to bring the baby script. Oh, shoot. Well, okay, um, shoot. Now, now, the, now the lines are going out of my head. And okay, Tawana, just pay attention so that you can hear your cue and just focus. Uh, listen, listen, focus. Fo- fo- Why is it quiet in here? Why are they all looking at me? Why do they look uneasy? And my new big brother, security guard number one, says to me supportively, hey, that's your cue. Here, you want to look at my script? Oh, God, I started getting hot. Y'all know my pits get itchy. I apologized. Then I said, would you guys mind if we take that back? And the two principal actors, Donald and James, kind of look at each other like, shit, this is going to be a long night. So we did the scene again. I took my cue. And I nailed it. But I could tell the principal actors and the director and the script supervisor had lost a little bit of faith in me. Oh, fuck. I told my new big brother, security guard number one, how I had panicked because I didn't have the baby sides. He giggled and reassured me that it was okay. On our way to dinner, the director pulled me aside and graciously said, Hey, so we're going to give your first line, the line that I missed, to security guard number one, you know, just to balance things out because he doesn't have a lot of lines. And I knew it was because they lost faith in me. But I appreciate that he wasn't one of those demeaning, shouting type of directors. And I knew I had to win them back. We were shuttled off in a passenger van with Donald to break for dinner. He was friendly and curious about us. He asked us a lot of questions and I felt this was my time to apologize to Donald for the mishap and that I didn't have the baby sides. But what I know for sure is no one wants to hear apologies or excuses. They just want you to do the work. So I remained relatively quiet in the van. I was embarrassed for the flub and for losing the one line and I didn't want to run the risk of saying anything that would further make Donald worry about my ability. Most times... It's just best to just shut up. So that's what I did. After dinner, it was time to shoot. Having a fantastic partner like security guard number one, my new big brother, made playing these roles effortless. And I did not disappoint them or myself. But it was great to watch. It was a master class watching Donald Log work. Because Donald Log is also a director, He was pitching ideas to the director, which made the scene better. But I learned from him that this whole thing is a collaborative effort and there's a way to communicate with a director who's open about ideas. If they're open, feel it out. Don't just start suggesting things. Don't overstep. But I understood why he's so good. 
why he's such a great actor, this finesse from watching him. We were wrapped at 2 a.m. Donal, James, the director, Michael, commended us on our performances, and it was time for me and my new big brother security guard number one to drive back to L.A. But I had no idea how to get to the highway. It was pitch black. It's been probably 10 hours. And um, remember, I didn't have a smartphone. So I told security guard number one, and he said, don't worry about it. I drive here all the time. You could just follow me. So I followed him. And once we got to L.A. County, he pointed me in the direction and waved goodbye. That's what it's like guesting on a show. You see somebody and you work with them for a couple of hours and you have this communication and this bond. And then you never see them again. Or sometimes you do. I got home at 4 a.m. I was exhausted, but the feeling of acting opposite Donald Log for my first network TV role kept me awake for a while. I was just like, it was such a tremendous sense of accomplishment. A few weeks after shooting that co-star, I had invited James, my agent, to speak at an event for actors. Someone from the audience asked James a question. How does he help actors on his roster who have no credits get auditions? In his response, he paid me an incredible compliment. He talked about how getting actors into audition rooms in general is always a challenge, but having actors who are developmental with no credits adds an extra layer of difficulty. But having actors like me who are willing to sometimes inconvenience themselves and drive far for an opportunity helps to make his job easier. He also stated that I was the only actor that he had gotten time slots for that didn't decline. And that booking gave James the fodder he needed to pitch me, to say, Tawana Floyd just worked opposite Donald Log, or... Tawana Floyd was just in a Sean Ryan production, or that Tawana Floyd just booked an FX television show. I moved to Los Angeles in September 2005, and the show aired September 2010. Five years it took me to book my first television credit, and it would be another five till I booked the next one, because nothing truly happens fast in Hollywood. And there really is no such thing as an overnight success. It takes years to gain momentum as an actor. And to all of my actor friends listening, please be kind to yourself and enjoy the journey. It may seem like things aren't happening for you or that everybody else around you is booking or things are happening. But just stay on your journey. Be consistent and do your work. And you'll see that your journey will start to blossom. And that's the end of this episode. It was a quick one. It was a short one, but it was worth sharing. I hope. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, if you learned something new, would you please subscribe? And if you want to learn more about me, you can go to my website at TawanaFloyd.com or check me out on Instagram. I hope you'll join me in two weeks from now where I'll share how I met my first theatrical agent, James. It's an unconventional story where I made a bold move outside of my comfort zone that resulted in me getting a theatrical agent. Until then, remember to always follow your intuition. It always knows best. I promise you, it's in the whispers. The information is in the whispers. Don't ignore them. That's your intuition.